Ladies and gentlemen, big apology because uh, we are almost 30 minutes late and uh, this is the first plenary which uh, aims at, uh, and this is actually the only plenary and only session which is very much aimed at the policy level. Everything else will be focused at the science and clinical practice an exchange of experiences and information. We do have uh, our honorable guests uh, with a great experience. We are lucky and unlucky at the same time because uh, one of our speakers could not make it. Uh, and uh, he was representing Uruguay. And Uruguay is an extremely interesting experience uh, as far as uh, the transition or change of paradigm is concerned uh, in the drug policy field. However, we are also lucky because uh, we have uh, exactly 60 minutes for five speakers. This is almost impossible to manage that. So I am supposed to start, but uh, when I look at uh, Steve, Michel, uh, our Austrian colleague, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Pachta, I think I will skip all of my presentation. <laughs> and I will stick just to inspire you and also to inspire or maybe catalyze the discussion because I would love to have a little bit of the discussion at the end. So I will stick with questions. The question number one is, how much are we successful and effective or cost effective or efficient in so-called fight against drugs as far as the national as well as global policies are concerned? Are we effective or not? And if not, why? Second, what is the ratio of the cost and the efficiency or the benefits to society on both public health as well as public safety side? So how much do we pay? How, how much and what we get out from our global as well as national and local drug policies? And the question number three is, when we look objectively, or when we try to look objectively at national, country, state drug policies around the world, do we see that the representatives of the countries or the policies itself, all of them are effective in the same way or are there differences? That means do we see some of countries just uh, introducing policies consuming less money and generating more results, more benefits to the society? And do we see also those countries doing just the opposite, that means consuming, wasting a lot of money just for zero effect or even more for unintended negative consequences. So I would like to raise these three questions uh, to our speakers. I know that they already had prepared their speeches, so just only think about that and uh, allow me first to introduce to you, uh, Professor Kazachkin, with, with, who has been actually already introduced. I should uh, say a few words more. First, medical doctor, scientist, politician and diplomat also, who uh, has been involved uh, for 30 years, uh, mostly in managing uh, the HIV and AIDS epidemics around the globe. He was uh, studying medicine in Paris and immunology uh, at the Pasteur Institute uh, 
He is a professor of medicine at the Descartes University in uh, Paris. Uh, in uh, 2005 and 2007, he was uh, a French ambassador for the HIV and AIDS. He was also the executive director of the Global Fund, uh, raising 20 billions of US dollars for just uh, tackling HIV AIDS drugs. In 2012, um, he was appointed as a special envoy of uh, UN Secretary General on HIV AIDS uh, for uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And uh, you also know uh, Professor Kazachkin as a global commissioner of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. So Michel, please, floor is yours.
Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. I said good morning. Good morning, everyone. In the U.S., we say good morning when someone says good morning to you. So one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There we go. Good morning. Okay. Um, I want to thank, uh, thank you for organizing this conference and for inviting me to be a part. Um, we have a, a lot to learn from each other as we're looking at uh, moving forward with uh, medical cannabis policy. Uh, and I also, um, anytime I'm, I'm listening to anyone talk about sensible drug policy around the globe, I feel like I have to apologize for my country's perspective on that, um, which uh, we like to brag that we're free, but that freedom comes at a price and which uh, we like to put people in jail um, so that others can be free. So. Um, it, is a very, it is a very odd perspective uh, working in the U.S. and knowing that people have, um, all have opinions about marijuana and they're very strong opinions. Um, so um, I want to just sort of talk a little bit today about the experiment that we've, we've been doing in the United States on medical cannabis and talk about some policy changes that have been happening, um, and some of them positive and, and some of them negative. Um, so as, as uh, as you all know, we have 50 states, and our federalist system, e each individual state can, can make their own laws, with some exceptions, um, and uh, that's not always clear what those exceptions are. Um, so um, a, a lot of uh, efforts have been made around civil protections. Um, some of our states have been very racist in the past, have, have, have not been very inclusive, and so um, some of the exceptions to the federalist system um, have been around human rights. Um, and cannabis right now uh, is not qualified as one of those. So um, every state has their own approach, and I will say that, that even though we have 23 states that have active medical cannabis programs, we actually have an additional 11 states that have uh, CBD-only laws that have passed last year, um, and it's all a little confusing, but every, every state is completely different. Um, no, no two programs are the same. So just a quick overview, um, even though we have this, this great experiment that now includes 34 states and the District of Columbia, this is still illegal federally, right? The med uh, cannabis is still illegal. Um, as I mentioned, we have the 34 states plus the district. Uh, it looks like Pennsylvania and Virginia are going to pass laws this year. Uh, there are four states that people have been talking about that have actually passed <laughs> full legalization, uh, Colorado, Washington were the first, um, and now we have added Oregon and Alaska, and the District of Columbia program allows for the use, but there's no legal sales um, in, in, in the district. So it's, it's, uh, it's almost the legalization that you mentioned uh, with, without, the, without the regulatory structure. Um, but the exciting thing is that we have actually over two million people in the United States that are legally using cannabis. Um, and unfortunately, uh, not very many of them are being researched. So we have this mass uh, experiment happening um, uh, where, it, where I actually don't have uh, researchers you know, following that experience uh, for the most part. Um, NIDA is, is actually conducting some research. Um, they, they say that they have 11 studies going on right now. Um, there's been an explosion in the concept of CBD in the United States and interest it mostly has to do with um, a television doctor, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, uh, did a few specials about um, child seizure disorders and cannabis that have made a, a very popular subject, um, which is why we've seen 11 states pass these CBD-only laws, um, and it's put uh, quite a bit of pressure on NIDA to move some products forward um, that, ha that offer CBD. Uh, in 1998, California um, created a research program through the, the UC program, the universities, um, which is actually where we have most of the research that was conducted in the United States was paid for. And actually, that, that, those projects took a long time, um, but a few years ago, those were actually finally published and are really the basis um, for most of the, the policy um, that we have in the United States. The United States does not like to consider research from other countries, um, so you can bring in Will barrels of other research, and they're like, yes, but it wasn't happen. It didn't happen here. Um, and but uh, last year, uh, Colorado actually awarded uh, 10 million dollars uh, for research studies, and there's actually a few people here that have that received those grants. Um, those are also going to be under the same restrictions um, as the the California program to only be able to use uh, the NIDA marijuana. So at the 
at the federal level, there's one producer of marijuana that's, a, that's allowed to be used for research for human clinical trials. Um, all of the other cannabis that's actually distributed through the state's programs um, is not considered high enough quality for human, human clinical studies. So the, the evolution of these laws has been very interesting to watch. In, in, the, in the late 90s, um, really sort of spurned by the uh, AIDS epidemic in the United States, uh, we started seeing what I would call compassionate use laws. So these laws were, were not quite about medical cannabis. Um, and let me explain. The, uh, in 1996, California passed a law that got rid of the criminal, uh, the criminal penalties, right? So it didn't say go to the pharmacy and pick up marijuana. What it said was that if you're dying and your doctor says it's okay and you get arrested, you can use a defense in court, right? And so those were run by, uh, by initiatives in the state of California. Washington followed in 1998. And slowly, we, we added on more and more states. But the beginning, the, you know, the, the campaigning around passing those laws was something like, if you're dying, you should get to smoke pot if you want to, right? And I think in California, you could, you could have replaced heroin or hookers, and the electorate would have voted, yes, if you're dying, you shouldn't go to jail for anything, right? So it, it's very different than, than medical use. Um, but then, as what we started seeing as those laws were put into place, that more and more um, doctors were recommending cannabis um, for, for dealing with chronic conditions. So it wasn't just for people that were dying of AIDS or dying of cancer. We found that there were populations, uh, like myself, of people that, that are living with medical cannabis. And so that meant that these laws had to be more robust. We needed to look at how are we going to distribute cannabis to these patients. We had to look at the other parts of a patient's life, right? So if you're not just talking about an individual who is going to die soon, who is looking for marijuana from an illegal source, then governments have a lot more responsibility um, to figure out how to treat these patients. And so in the mid-2000s, we start, started seeing distribution systems added to these laws, right? And, and <coughs> all of these distribution systems are very different. Um, some of them allow cities, local cities and counties, to develop programs, and as we're as more and more of these laws are passing and we're learning more about sort of best practices, um, uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, different licensing structures. Some of them, uh, one license will allow someone to cultivate, manufacture, and distribute. In some of the states, you have to get those licenses separately. So it's a separate company that's cultivating, a separate company that is manufacturing, and then yet again, a, a separate system that is distributing medical cannabis. Um, but, but anytime you're in the U.S., you're uh, distributing something commercially, there are a set of, you know, product safety regulations um, are, are usually a part of that process. And in uh, 2010, we started seeing um, product safety standards added to these laws. And a lot of that was in, in due to, the, to uh, work with the American Herbal Pharmacopeia that produced a cannabis monograph. Um, some of the authors uh, of that, Ethan Russo, uh, Jay Hamarku are here. Uh, Mashulam was a reviewer. Um, and now, now those product safety protocols are became, becoming law as well. We also began working with the American Herbal Products Association to develop GMP standards for cultivation, manufacturing, uh, for labs, and for distribution. So the new laws that are passing, uh, the cannabis is regulated from seed to consumption, um, which, is, which is very exciting. Um, so this is, uh, this is a patchwork, um, obviously, <laughs> of all of these laws. But we um, issued a report last year really looking at all the different state laws. Because a lot of people, when they talk about medical cannabis, they think it's either a vote up, yes, medical cannabis, or no. And the truth is um, what makes a good medical cannabis law is, uh, is much more complicated. So the darker um, states have the better laws, and as they get lighter, um, and, and, and purple, um, they're the less productive. So the way that we evaluated these state grades, you know, looking at all of the different state programs, were um, under these four categories. One was patient rights and civil protections um, from discrimination. So once someone became a, a cannabis patient, um, what was their life like? Could they still go to jail? Some of the, some of the laws, um, still a patient can get arrested even if they have a card from their um, government 
uh, and then they have to sort it out in court later. Many of the states do not have civil protections. So even though your doctor says you can use medical cannabis, you're still at risk of losing your job, um, losing your children, losing your home. Um, and so um, that's one major category. The other is access to medicine. Um, some of the states that have really restrictive programs have developed laws that are so restrictive that nobody's being served. Um, the earlier uh, laws allowed for individual patients to be able to cultivate for themselves, and now many of the new states do not allow uh, patient cultivation or patient cultivation in a very restrictive fashion. And while that may make sense on paper, the reality is, is that once we pass one of these state laws, it takes at least 18 months for the first cannabis seed to be placed in the ground to serve those patients. So if there, if there are cultivation uh, criteria, patients are getting that medicine uh, more easily. The next is ease of navigation. How, how hard is it to, to become part of that program? Um, again, lots of the states create regulatory structures that make it um, you know, basically not, not, not much better than it was before. And then just functionality. Is, is, is the government actually opening businesses? Is it, is it, is it really working? So I know this is very small, but, it, um, but, but of the states, um, and I have this report with me, several copies if people want to see this while I'm here this weekend. Um, mostly I wanted to put this up to let people see how many Fs there are um, for the grades, and there's actually not a single state that has a perfect program. Um, and people ask me, why didn't I use a curve for grading? Um, and I said, ask a, ask a mother who's losing her children if she would like to be a part of a curve. Right, so each one of these, these items that we're grading on um, are, are part of, of, a, of a patient's life. Um, Maine actually has the, the highest program, and I just wanted you to see sort of what, what these different um, uh, categories look like. But I'm just gonna give you a, a couple items under each of these. So for patients' rights, um, is, it, is there a rec arrest protection or a defense in court, right? Th those are part of the grading. Um, a lot of the states, um, uh, still patients who are medical cannabis patients legally uh, are denied organ transplants. Um, they're not allowed on those lists. Uh, we've actually had several of our members die over the last few years um, because they were, they were kicked out of those programs. Um, access to medicine, as I mentioned, are there dispensaries? Is there personal cultivation? Um, we're starting to see specific products actually get, get banned. So some of the states allow for whole plant cannabis and edible products and concentrates. Some of them uh, have made edible products illegal. Um, so that's, that's part of what we looked at. Um, functionality I already explained pretty well. Um, ease of navigation. Some of these are, um, are, um, are seem pretty nitpicky, but, but this is actually what, what patients are looking for for this law. Like if you have MS, your MS is not gonna be cured in the next year. So does it make sense that you have to pay the government every year for a card to allow you to use medical cannabis. Does that make sense? So, so some of those, those items that just, they sound good on paper, but aren't quite working. And this list, I just wanna tell you where this came from. Um, my organization, uh, over a three year period, held over 100 public events uh, at public libraries and you know, in towns that you've probably never heard of. I hadn't heard of all of them actually. Uh, and we, we asked patients what did they want from their programs. So if you, the question was, if you woke up tomorrow and you had everything you wanted from a medical cannabis program, what would it look like? And this is, this is that list. Uh, maybe a little updated. So under the Obama administration, we actually have moved from a, uh, a more tolerant federal policy. Um, in August of 2013, the Department of Justice issued a memo outlaying um, basically eight items that if states followed these eight protocols, um, then they wouldn't uh, disturb the program. And that federal interference has looked like a, several things. One, elected officials have been threatened by the federal government in the past, saying that if they implemented the programs, they would be arrested. No one has ever been arrested. It was, a, it was definitely a political threat. Um, but individual patients um, have gone to jail. People serving individual patients have had paramilitary-style raids on those facilities. Uh, we've had about um, about 300 of those raids um, and about 150 people who have gone through the federal legal system. So this was a very big thing, right, to have the Department of Justice tell uh, 
the DEA and Department of Justice um, that if these programs were following these criteria, um, that they that it shouldn't be a priority. Now, um, not everyone has followed this. U.S. attorneys have discretion in each state. So in some of the more liberal states, um, we've had less problems. Um, but depending on the individual U.S. attorney, they decide. Um, and so there's still have been quite a few prosecutions. So these are pretty basic, making sure that minors um, aren't getting cannabis, um, some way to prevent the sale of marijuana going to criminal enterprises, all things you can expect from a regu regulated system. Uh, and I won't go into to all of these, but I will say that this is actually a chart with the medical cannabis laws and each of the eight criteria. And you can see these are citations from the state laws and regulations that every state is meeting those eight criteria. And here's more of those. And again, all of this is, is in the, this report if you'd like to see it. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting you to want to memorize it, but I just wanted to show you that that um, as, um, as states are creating these programs, that they've already had these sort of basic common sense items in mind. And last year, <coughs> uh, we actually passed a, an amendment to our spending bill, our, our, our federal uh, budget bill, um, that prohibits the federal government from interfering with these medical cannabis programs. Um, so far, um, the prosecutions that were in place are still going forward. Uh, this is something that we're gonna have uh, figure out in the courts. Um, there's still about a dozen people in prison, a dozen people being prosecuted, and my organization is working in the courtrooms. Uh, we're trying to get oversight hearings at the Department of Justice to make sure that this actually does something. Um, and uh, we have to pass this again uh, for the next budget bill. So it's, this isn't by any means a, uh, an, a fix. It is just a, a temporary uh, cease um, ceasefire is the way that we, we've described it. Um, but we had been working on passing this, this, this uh, resolution for 11 years, um, so it was very exciting to finally see the federal government move forward. Um, even if, if it's not doing everything that we wanted, this is the first federal law that's passed on medical cannabis. Um, and something I just wanted to bring up, because I heard many of the panels um, talking about, about the recreational market and the medical market, and I think one of the most frustrating things for, for me working on this issue as a medical cannabis patient is that is the misunderstanding about this plant and how these different consumers use this plant. Um, and so now that we've actually passed um, a few recreational bills, uh, what we're seeing on the ground in those states is pretty frightening. Uh, we're seeing actually um, the governments and the companies that are selling marijuana to the recreational market lobbying to get rid of the medical marijuana programs altogether. Um, they, and that they just want the patients to buy from the recreational market. And I think that, that, that if you think that the, the totality of the issue of medical cannabis is that people who are sick and dying um, should get to feel better if they want to, then maybe it does make sense. If that's really what, what you think medical cannabis is, to make people go to a recreational store. But hopefully what we all know in this room um, is that the experience of the patients isn't that they're dying uh, while using cannabis, is that they're living, right? And so, that, so when we're looking at regulations for these markets, we have to consider want versus need, right? An individual like myself, I, uh, I started Americans for Safe Access in California where I was a legal patient, but then I had to move to Washington, D.C. Um, to work on the national level, and I began living like a criminal again. Um, and I, I wasn't going to let my kidneys fail um, you know, just to not break a law, right? And so that is, that is our experience. So there's definitely a difference between those of you who want cannabis uh, because you enjoy it and those of us that need it. Uh, the products that we want are very different. Um, it, it is, I am not looking for the thing that makes me the most intoxicated. Um, that is not helpful. I have a full-time job and a half. Um, and so I'm looking for products that help with inflammation and pain but allow me to function. Right? And so you can see that it, the investments in product development, if we were put into one place, um, th those are two different categories. I don't want, I don't, I'm not interested in finding the cannabis that is going to make me the most intoxicated. Um, taxes are, are a big deal because cannabis patients, we use a lot more cannabis than your average recreational user. Um, we use probably what you use in a month, in a day or week. Um, and so we have to make sure that we can afford that. 
Uh, we're hoping in the U.S. one day that insurance will cover medical cannabis. It's a ways off, but we're working on it. The distribution systems are different, right? What I, what I need the person selling me my medicine, that I need them to know, um, it, you know, things about that product, what symptoms it's going to control, um, very different relationship and conversation um, than people that are hope, you know, wanting to know which cannabis is going to enhance the rock concert they're going to. Um, and the stigma is very different, right? Again, with, with, with want versus need. Um, and so I'm just hoping that as we talk about these, these issues of cannabis, uh, while it's the same plant, that we're making room and space for both systems and that they're never sort of put into the same, same category. Um, uh, this is where you can download the report I was talking about. Um, we also have model legislation and model regulations um, that, that have you know, really been sort of the best of what we've learned in this experiment. And we still have a lot of challenges. Like I said, it's still illegal federally. Uh, if we can change federal law, I think more states would move forward. Uh, we still have to improve um, all of those states that I mentioned, right? We're working to get those Fs up to Ds, up to hopefully one day up to, to A grades. Uh, we still need insurance coverage. We still need employment and civil protections. Um, we're, we still need to figure out how um, our patients that are using cannabis can, can qualify for organ transplants nationwide. Um, stigma and discrimination is a huge issue. Uh, and dosage standards is really the next level. You know, where we can actually tell a patient, um, you know, what exactly, what product they need and how much of it they need to take. Um, and then uh, we actually have a conference in Washington, D.C. if you want to know more about all of this great experiment at the end of the month. Um, and we'd love to see, see you all there. Thank you very much, Steph for the presentation as well as for keeping the timing. Uh, our next speaker, and we definitely will have some time for discussion at the end of the plenary. The next speaker uh, is uh, Pavel Pachta, uh, who is an economist, uh, independent consultant uh, in uh, international uh, relations and policies. Uh, he spent quite some time as a high officer with, within INCB, International Narcotic Control Board, uh, who is an institution, as we know, uh, controlling uh, how the UN conventions on drugs are uh, in practice implemented. So, uh, Pavel, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. You have just mentioned I, have, I was uh, international civil servant, so I'm not a politician and I'm not an advocate or activist. So, uh, uh, to having me in a political debate is a bit difficult, but still one thing I would like to mention what I like today What was said by mr. Wobozil who is the present current Czech uh, drug Tsar in the first uh, session that it is important to see that there are two different debates going on in the world and one is about this uh, regulated recreational use, authorizing regulated recreational use of drugs. This is one very legitimate debate. And the second debate, which is in a way uh, our uh, debate of this conference, is how to use cannabis and cannabinoids for medical purposes. So uh, two areas, one about legalization of, uh, of uh, a recreational use and second area is uh, the medical use of cannabis. Uh, I think I would agree with those who think that it is not very good for uh, the medical cannabis if these two discussions somewhat overlap, you know, if we, if we mix it. And then uh, I think also the speaker before just uh, uh, mentioned how in the United States uh, uh, in practice in a way uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, problems uh, when two of these developments go in one stay. It was quite interesting comment. So I will not speaking any more politically but uh, to give you some uh, possibility to understand or to, to you know to, to know what are these international drug control treaties I would like to give a very quick uh, presentation and I will speak in Czech so that you can hear the foreigners again this language and uh, I uh, prepare the slides are in English so I think it might be a good combination. 
So, Mr. President, the first slide is about the objective of my presentation. Is medical use and research possible? Je tedy možné používat konopí a kanabidoidy pro lékařské účely, zdali to současné mezinárodní konvence o kontrole drog dovolují. Tak to je cíl mého vystoupení. Které to jsou ty mezinárodní konvence? Mnozí z vás to znají, ale velice rychle. Existuje konvence o narkotikách, ta je z roku 61, pod ní je kontrolováno 119, uh, drak, uh, 119 narkotik. Konvence o psychotropních látkách je z roku 71, pod ní je kontrolováno 116 psychotropních látek. A pak ještě existuje konvence OSN proti nelegálnímu obchodu s narkotiky a psychotropními látkami. Tam je pod tou konvencí je kontrolováno 24 chemikálií, které lze, anebo které jsou často využívány při nelegální výrobě drog. Takže tyhle ty tři konvence tvoří mezinárodní drogový systém teď, v současnosti. Prosím vás, téměř všechny státy světa a prakticky všechny státy světa jsou smluvními stranami těchto konvencí. To znamená, že jejich vlády a Řekněme tedy, naše vlády se zavázaly, že budou tyto konvence uh, plnit. Uh, další slide říká, co je cílem těchto konvencí. A cílem těch konvencí, tak jak je to v nich zapsáno, a já teď neříkám, jestli se jim to všem zemím daří naplňovat, tak jak je to v těch konvencích napsáno, ale cílem těch konvencí je uh, uh, omezit omezit používání narkotik a psychotropních látek pouze k léčebným a vědeckým účelům a přitom současně zajistit i jejich dostupnost pro tyto účely. Takže to je oficiální cíl konvencí, to je v nich napsáno. Tohle, co jsem teď řekl, platí pro naprostou většinu kontrolovaných substancí, ale ne pro všechny. U těch narkotik a psychotropních látek, které jsou pokládány za velice nebezpečné a které přitom nemají zvláštní terapeutický význam, tak konvence dokonce zmiňuje možnost restrikce jejich léčebného a vědeckého využívání. Takže to je tedy skutečnost současných konvencí v principu umožnit omezit používání drog kontrolovaných látek pro léčebné a vědecké účely a zajistit jejich dostupnost. Ale u některých, u těch, které jsou pokládány za zvlášť nebezpečné a přitom terapeuticky nepříliš významné, tak se navrhuje dokonce restriktovat jejich medical a vědecký úz. Takže se podívejme velmi rychle, jak je, to, jak je to s kanabisem, jak je to s konopím. Takhle vypadá konvence z roku 1961. Ona má čtyři seznamy a prosím vás, před těmi 54 lety zástupci vlád nebo vlády, když tu konvenci sjednávali, tak zapsali konopí, zapsali pryskyřici konopnou, extrakty, tinktury z konopí do prvního seznamu této konvence. Pokládají je tedy za drogy, za narkotika a tam v tom seznamu jsou ještě s dalšími zhruba 110, jako je morfín, jako je opium, jako je oxycodon, jako je fentanyl, jako je metadon, prostě z narkotiky. E, máme strašně málo času. E, prosím vás, ta konvence má tedy první seznam, tam je těch 110 látek, v druhém seznamu je jich jenom trošku, je jich 10, tam je třeba kodejín, e, ty jsou kontrolovány méně. Ne, nejsou pokládány za také nebezpečné. Ve třetím seznamu, tam je ta zelená jaksi nejplatnější, ty se mohou používat, tam je zelená barva k jejich používání. To jsou přípravky, které jsou výjimuty z některých kontrolních opatření, ale tam v současné době nic o kanabisu, nic o kanabisových přípravcích není, tam žádný nenajdete, ale tyto přípravky u nich jsou minimální, tedy kontrolní opatření. Čtvrtý seznam obsahuje a to je zajímavé, ten jsem dal v červeném, protože to znamená pozor, nebo dokonce stop. Tam zase zapsali kanabis a zase tam zapsali kanabis rezin, tedy smůlu kanabisovou. A jak už zmiňovali řečníci přede mnou, on je tam kanabis dokonce třeba s heroinem a s dalšími, s dalšími látkami, etorfínem, ketobemidonem, tedy s dalšími látkami. Co tedy ta konvence říká o látkách ve čtvrtém seznamu? Ta říká, že to jsou právě oni. To jsou ty zvláště náchylné k tomu, aby byly zneužívány a škodily. A současně 
ty jejich terapeutické výhody nejsou takové, že by je neměly jiné, jiné látky. Tak to říká konvence. A konvence uvádí, že jestliže tedy smluvní strana si myslí, že by to bylo nejvhodnější, tak smluvní strana má zvážit možnost zákazu, zákazu těchto, těchto drog. Uh, takže uh, vidíte, uh, prosím vás, uh, já se vrátím ještě k tomuto slajdu, že takto to bylo v roce de, uh, 1961. Uh, umístili tedy kanabis uh, a kanabis do čtvrtého seznamu. No a jak my uh, víme, tak, uh, uh, tak uh, tedy hodně vlád se tím letím začalo řídit a prakticky kanabis zmizel z medikálního používání. Byly nějaké výjimky, ale prakticky kanabis prostě zmizel. Takže jaké další závěry tedy pro, pro naší diskuzi? To znamená, my už jsme slyšeli, hodně lidí bude říkat, není to dobře, že kanabis ve čtvrtém seznamu prostě by tam neměl být, ale zatím tam je. Takže co za této situace je podstatné? Za této situace je podstatné, že rozhodnutí zakázat kanabis je v konvenci ponecháno na uvážení jednotlivých smluvních stran. Takže konvence to nepřikazuje, ponechává na uvážení. A jestliže se dnes stále více vlád rozhoduje proto, aby opět povolili léčebné používání konopí, tak ty vlády konvenci nijak neporušují. Takže to je důležité, jestliže vláda povolí e, používání konopí, tak tu konvenci nijak neporušuje. Pokud jde o tinktury, pokud jde o extrakty z kanabisu, e, tak ty jsou jenom v tom prvním seznamu, ty nejsou v tom čtvrtém, takže tam vůbec nikdo ani nějak e, ta konvence prostě ne, nenavrhovala, aby se, aby se zakazovali. Takže třeba Sativex, který, e, který britský produkt, jo, který vy znáte, který se používá, založený na extraktech, tak ten je v prvním seznamu. Jinými slovy, konvence dovolují používání těchto látek a to za stejných standardních podmínek kontroly jako jiných narkotik. Takže samozřejmě víte, že to jsou dosti náročné, administrativně náročné kontrolní požadavky, třeba na morfín, že? Na metadon od výrobce až po spotřebitele. Konvence umožňuje používat kanabis stejně za stejných podmínek pro lékařské účely. Takže dneska už máme stále více více zemí, které s tím začínají. Já myslím, že tenhle slide může být docela zajímavý, kde se jak mnoho toho konopí, konopí teď už pro lékařské účely používá. Pan doktor Bem zmínil, že já jsem pracoval pro Mezinárodní výbor pro kontrolu narkotik a ten má právě za úkol, za úkol monitorovat, jak vlády dodržují konvence a jak je plní. A to znamená, vlády musí tomuto výboru podávat nejrůznější hlášení a statistiky. No a jednou z nich je také, že vlády oznamují výboru, kolik budou potřebovat jednotlivých narkotik. Takže prosím vás, tohle jsem si obsal z webové stránky toho AMCB teďka z února, jaké požadavky pro kanabis, pro zdravotní, pro medikální účely vlády nahlásily. A vidíte tady z toho, že tedy kanabis se v současnosti používá pro ty zdravotní účely v největší míře v Kanadě, tam 55 tun nahlásila jí vláda, že bude potřebovat tento rok, v Izraeli 10 tun, takže tam už jsou to zřejmě tisíce a možná desetitisíce lidí v Kanadě, kteří uh, přístup k tomu uh, lékařskému uh, kanabisu mají. Ty ostatní země, uh, uh, jak je vidět, v podstatě začínají, uh, ale vidíte tam tu tendenci. Když se podíváme do roku 2010, tak vidíte, jaké byly ty potřeby tenkrát a jak prostě ty potřeby narůstají. Třeba Itálie uh, tady uh, startuje dopředu. Na devátém místě je Česká republika. Víte, že v tom odhadu současném je 95 kg. Prosím vás, to také inkluzivuje nebo už prostě zahrnuje kanabisové extrakty, třeba sativex, že? Takže to je zahrnuto už tady v tom odhadu. No a samozřejmě my jsme právě slyšeli, že v USA ještě léčebné konopí není z federálního hlediska legální. Pro americkou vládu tyhle ty národní programy, tedy státní programy v těch mnoha státech jsou nelegální, takže USA nám nic nehlásí. Takže nám nic nehlásí, já už tam nepatřím, jsem 
v důchodu, ale USA tomu INCB nic nehlásí. Takže v realitě samozřejmě by Spojené státy americké byly na prvním místě, že? V téhle tabulce a naší Českou republiku by tedy odsunuli na v současné době místo desáté. Prosím vás, další rychlou poznámku, když někdo se rozhodne povolit medical cannabis, tak tam jsou ještě v konvenci některé další věci, pokud se rozhodne ten cannabis produkovat sám, pokud pěstuje cannabisovou rostlinu, musí vytvořit takzvanou národní cannabisovou agenturu nebo národní agenturu pro cannabis a tam musí přísně kontrolovat kultivaci, musí vydávat licence na kultivaci a má mít monopol na zásoby a dokonce i na velkoobchodní zásoby a na zahraniční obchod s kanabisem. To konvence předpisuje. Pro vás, kdo se regulací hodně zajímáte, myslím, že by bylo zajímavé se podívat včera. Mezinárodní výbor pro kontrolu narkotik ANCB zveřejnil svůj report, svoji zprávu za minulý rok. A má tam paragrafy 218 až 227 právě o medical cannabis. Takže tam je pro mě, já jsem se na to tak rychle podíval, co tam tedy napsali. Je tam zajímavé, že tedy se otevřeně tam podívali na otázku, jak je to s pěstováním kanabisu pro osobní spotřebu. A v této věci ANCB říká, že prostě kontrola není dostatečná a že je proti tomu, že si myslí, že to není v souladu s konvencemi, to pro osobní spotřebu. Velice rychle. Jak je, to, jak je to s kanabinoidy? Z těch je kontrolován jenom tetrahydrokanabinol, takže kanabidiol není kontrolován. Tady vidíte, kde některé izoméry jsou v prvním seznamu konvence, a to je konvence z roku 71, ale ten pro nás nejzajímavější a terapeuticky nejdůležitější delta 9 THC dronabinol, ten je v seznamu 2. V seznamu 2, kde je společně třeba s metylfenidátem, s ritalinem, takže je tam kontrola, já bych to řekl tak, o něco méně přísná, požadovaná než pro narkotika. Ta konvence z roku 71 je méně přísná, požaduje kontrolu o něco menší než pro narkotika. Velice rychle, čas není, první schedule, tam mají být ty látky prakticky zakázány, to znamená, tam je třeba LSD a tam je několik izomerů tetrahydrokanabinolu a ve druhém schedule, tedy ve druhém seznamu, tam jsou látky, které lze pro zdravotní účely používat. Tam je tedy dronabinol. Dronabinol je možno používat pro zdravotní účeny. Uvedl jsem na tomto slajdu, kolik byla spotřeba dronabinolu podle toho, co vlády nahlásili ANCB za rok 2012. Takže to je zajímavé. Tenhle ten, tenhle ten kanabinoid, ten v USA je legální, takže v USA se spotřeboval nejvíce 103 kg. Je tam známý, je tam komercializován jako marinol, že? Takže USA je první zemí, pokud jde o jeho konzumci, Německo 4,8, Rakousko 2,8 kg nahlásili. Uh, ANCB. Prosím vás, uh, tady to jsou ty trošky kilogramů, ale kdybychom se podívali, kolik uh, se spotřebuje třeba toho ritalínu, uh, tak uh, jestli se nepletu, uh, tak uh, tam máme asi uh, 40 tun, jo? Takže, pro, uh, takže ritalínu 50 tun, 50 tun ročně. Takže látky, které jsou v tom druhém seznamu, ono je možné je používat pro zdravotní účely. Hodně zemí se naučilo, jak to dělat, uh, ta, hlavně ty vyspělé země. A uh, tady vidíte, že toho na binolu se ještě používá hodně málo. Samozřejmě museli bychom srovnat taky denní dávky, abychom se mohli více vyjádřit, ale není ho tady používáno mnoho. Uh, další, uh, jeden už teď se blížím k závěru, uh, samozřejmě, že je tady strašně moc diskuze o tom, kontraverze, je tady veliká kritika uh, toho, jak je konopí v současných kon, uh, konvencích kontrolováno, kam je zařazeno. A e, kritikové e, se tedy zamlouvaj, přimlouvají za to, aby se to změnilo, aby kanabis odešel z toho čtvrtého seznamu někam jinam. E, jedna změna už se povedla, to bylo v roce 1991, ten dronabinol byl původně také v prvním seznamu konvence z roku 71. Jeho používání bylo téměř zakázáno. E, v roce 1991 komise OSM pro narkotika přemístila dronabinol z dru, prvního seznamu do druhého. 
Bohužel chybí tady hodně mezinárodní koncensus v této věci. Světová zdravotnická organizace už, já nevím, víc než 10 let navrhuje, aby se delta 9 tetrahydrokanabinol pohnul z toho druhého seznamu ještě dál do méně kontrolovaných seznamů. Do třetího. Původně navrhovali do čtvrtého, teď navrhovali do třetího. Ale když potom o tom hlasovala Komise pro narkotika Loni, tak jestliže moje poznámky z jejich oficiální zprávy jsou správné, tak jenom devět zemí hlasovalo pro to, aby se přesunul, ale 20 jich bylo proti a další se zase zdržovali hlasování. Takže oni ty vlády, které jsou v té komisi OSM pro narkotika, třeba tuhle změnu odmítly s tím zdůvodněním, že asi ještě nebyla dost dostatečně zdůvodněná a tak dále, ta navrhovaná změna. Je to prostě nesmírně politické, Uh, oni se tam promítají i nejenom vědecká, uh, vědecké jaksi hodnocení, které by asi měly uh, uh, převládnout, ale hodně takových politických úvah. Uh, zřejmě v brzké době Světová zdravotnická organizace nám dodá také nové hodnocení kanabisu, tak jak vůbec se dívá na kanabis, protože přibývá výzev, aby Světová zdravotnická organizace skutečně, a ta má na to mandát v mezinárodních konvencích, se podívala, jak nebezpečný je kanabis a kam by tedy měl reálně pod mezinárodní kontrolu patřit. Dokonce i ten Mezinárodní výbor pro kontrolu narkotik, který dohlíží, tedy, který jenom na to dohlíží, jak současné konvence jsou plněné, vyzývá opakovaně v posledních letech Světovou zdravotnickou organizaci, aby takové přehodnocení přinesla. Potom uvidíme ovšem, jak se k tomu zachovají vlády. A takže jenom můj rychlý závěr pro účastníky této konference. Kanabis, kanabinoiny, tetrahydrokanabinol lze používat v rámci současných konvencí pro zdravotní účely za podmínek, které platí pro narkotika a pro psychotropní látky. Některé země se s tím naučily naučili pracovat. Takže ta možnost tady je a je hodně na vládách. Je tady veliká flexibilita, záleží hodně na vládách, jak ty možnosti, které konvence v současné době namízejí využít. Děkuju a omlouvám se, že to bylo trošku delší. Děkuju. Thank you very much. We are a little bit behind the schedule, so uh, the last speaker is uh, Dr. Eberhard Perch. Uh, he is a neighbor uh, from Austria, representing the International Cannabis Research Society, and uh, he is going to uh, present uh, the Austrian model of the prescription and reimbursement of cannabinoids. And I'm, I apologize myself. I'm just pushing you to be as fast as possible, Eberhard. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the Austrian model and the Austrian uh, prescription of, of uh, model of prescription and reimbursement of cannabinoids is based on a very sound legal basis from the very start and very beginning and it's now about 10 years uh, that uh, this mainly magisterial tronabinol is used uh, from Austrian physicians to treat uh, some of the diseases. This, this model is uh, the legal basis is on three uh, laws which uh, have a platform built which between the Austrian Ministry of Health, the Austrian Ministry of Justice, and of course also the Austrian Agency for Health and Food Safety and uh, the industry. Industry producing and distributing for medical purposes, mainly magisterial dronabinol. Now, the Austrian uh, market uh, covers uh, finished products, which is uh, marinol is uh, synthetic THC is not available. Cesamet uh, nabilone, uh, synthetic two, is uh, only available as a uh, let's say magisterial drug and Sativex of course is also available on the Austrian market. But the main prescriptions are in the form of magisterial drugs in form of uh, drug solutions, uh, dr uh, drops, drop solution as well as uh, dr capsules in different strength. Since the very beginning the Bionoricas and the companies approach uh, in this public-private uh, partnership 
was to familiarize physicians with the vital role played by the endocannabinoid system for the maintenance of homeostasis. Uh, this means uh, that uh, this led not only to the use of THC dronabinol in internationally approved indications uh, like those for marinol, for synthetic dronabinol, but also for the treatment of new diseases in which, according to the latest scientific findings, the endocannabinoid system plays an important role uh, e.g. in the geriatric, you have heard something, neurology field, psychiatric field, uh, but mainly also in oncology and palliative care as well as in the management of chronic pain. Now, what is the endocannabinoid system and disorder? The vital uh, role of this system is to m maintain the homeostasis in all higher organisms. That means uh, the control of appetite, body weight, antiemetic for some extent, sleep, the protection against uh, infl uh, inflammations, or in uh, uh, also the protection against uh, proliferative, uh, proliferative activity of certain diseases. And uh, this system is linked uh, sometimes uh, to uh, these exogene dronabinol, this cannabinoid, in because dronabinol mimics these endogenous, the, the body itself has an own system, the so-called endocannabinoid system, as you heard, and this has also uh, receptor and ligands and anandamide and 2-HG, uh, are two of those, and they activate some receptors, CB1 and CB2, and over these systems, a lot of functions are regulated according uh, the what I have shown before. So, uh, this exogen dronabinol, or TG9, can be used uh, for reduction of anxiety, pain, muscular tonus, uh, for example, sleep facilitations, but also uh, for other things uh, like neuroprotection or reactions uh, to stress and so on. Now, how it is used in Austria? It is used uh, uh, in the pain, to alleviate pain, spasticity and anxiety, it stimulates appetite, it suppresses nausea and vomiting. It uh, can be, and this is a very, very important point, because uh, THC resembles from the molecular structure uh, to the body's own endocannabinoids. It is uh, also, let's say, recognized by the body not as a chemical foreign substance, but more on as someone which resembles to the own regulatory system. And that means that uh, in, uh, in, in, in the end, it displays these uh, substances, not only THC, but also substances out of cannabis as well, display no organ or a very s little organ toxicity. And you will hear a little bit later that this is very, very important, uh, particularly in the field of palliative care and chronic neurological diseases. Now, very shortly, only THC9 can be produced on different use. And uh, the, at the forefront is more than 20 years ago, Marinol, which is a purely synthetic uh, uh, THC. And, uh, but today, it can be, and it is being uh, produced in Austria also directly by extraction from the cannabis plant. And this is, uh, as uh, my pre-speaker uh, has already pointed out, uh, this is a, a, a monopoly of the state. He's the only who is able to produce 
uh, a canopy sativa, and this is done in Austrian gas houses. And then uh, the, 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 uh, the blossoms uh, and uh, the plants are uh, yielded and, and are processed to the final product by an extraction <coughs> process. Uh, now, therapeutic options in Austria for this magisterial uh, dronabinol pain, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, and psychiatric to uh, categorize that. And uh, I will uh, drop that a little bit. The most important in Austria is uh, the add-on medication for patients who are on a chronic treatment of opioids uh, that may uh, result in side effects, and these side effects can be improved by, a, a, let's say, a combination with THC-9. But now, this is uh, uh, what I want to say because it is in Austria one of the main focus of the medical use of that, uh, is the palliative care uh, the palliative care not only for oncology patients but also for patients suffering from neurodegenerative uh, diseases like <coughs> Alzheimer's and others and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and so on. And what is uh, in common to all that patients? In common to all that patients is uh, they are mainly elderly patients, they are uh, uh, they present a multimorbidity, uh, they have several diseases at the same spot, and uh, the patients are treated on several medications and the pharmacokinetics, the biotransformation, and even the elimination uh, rates of this are often decreased and not well calculated in advance. So the consequence is drug inter interaction happens, side effects uh, 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 happens, and I come back to that, what I have said previously, uh, the non-toxic substances like THC is there a measurement to improve the quality of life of those patients. And palliative care patients are, uh, this is their most valuable asset they have and this applies to all these patient populations. And in this respect, our focus and our educational programs towards the physician have focused to, to present and to uh, educate them in the proper use in those patients. Now, beside THC, uh, another uh, very important for the medical use, important medicine may be CBD. It's CBD, it's at the beginning in the medical use, and, but it's also a key account, uh, and it will come up uh, uh, very fast uh, if, uh, for example, clinical research can be improved in this matter, and this relates uh, to the regulations which my predecessor uh, speakers has said that uh, at the time when the international conventions has been put forward, uh, none of that medical uses have been known, and therefore they could not be taken in consideration in putting it in, in, a, in a proper legal situation. Now, let me conclude. Cannabis, a gateway to health. Uh, we, you have heard there are two issues. The, the, the recreational and the medical issue. Health benefits today of cannabis in which application form ever far exceed its dangers. Uh, that has research brought up. Much of cannabis use for medical pur purposes is preliminary, but it adds up to a call for more professional, large scale, Large scale means also beyond countries. It, it, it must be much more internationalized, particularly clinical research. Clinical research is impaired today in the cannabis field most to access this ancient and even more popular herb. 
Thank you. Thank you, Eberhard, and thanks a lot to all speakers for an excellent presentation. We have space for two questions. There will be a lot of opportunities to ask questions uh, later on during the next three days. So two questions, please. please. Can you just introduce yourself very briefly? Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. My name is Martin Poliacic. I'm a member of Parliament in Slovak Republic. And uh, I'd like to ask about what you, Mr. Kazachkin, haven't finished in your speech. And those are the possibilities of changes of the conventions of the UN. Because uh, uh, in many countries, the conventions are used as, in, as an argument for not changing the policies at all. And uh, Slovakia is one of those countries. And the uh, war on drugs uh, is still in full fire. Uh, it's very hard to argument against it, and uh, if uh, probably 2016 might be the year of the end of the war, uh, it might be much easier for people like me to argument in the Slovak parliament that we are in the Middle Ages and we should move forward. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That the key questions at the end. Michel, this is for you, probably. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, very relevant, of course, as we prepare for UNGAS 2016. Um, the, uh, the way people argue, and now I turn <laughs> not to you, Steph, but to the U.S. I mean, what the U.S. are saying these days is let's use what the term you used, uh, Mr. Pashta, uh, flexibilities. Mm -hmm. They say there are conventions and there are flexibilities within conventions. That's a new language, by the way, in the US. A few years ago, they would never have said that. They're saying this because obviously, with the referenda and what's happening in, in started in Colorado and Washington state is, is putting them in a very difficult situation and in tension with the conventions. So they're saying, well, in fact, there are flexibilities and we should use the conventions with flexibilities, but we should stick to the conventions. And uh, and now I'm ex speaking on I'm in my personal capacity, and uh, you know, not of course as a UN person here, or even as a member of the Global Commission. I'd like to say, you know, I I really think uh, this is not the right approach, and it's potentially dangerous, because if you say um, let's never touch the conventions and use flexibilities, it means that those who wish to use flexibilities will do so. Those who do not wish to use flexibilities and who want to remain on very conservative, repressive law enforcement prohibition uh, will stay there and, and the world will, will not move. So I think one day or another, you know, we need to revisit those conventions. This is a hugely difficult process, and this will not happen at uh, UNGAS 2016. What we hope, and here I speak on behalf of the Commission, what we hope is that at UNGAS 2016, people will acknowledge what you're saying, that the war on drugs have failed, that the uh, policies um, are restrictive policies are harmful and that the debate should be opened for the future. That's, I think, the most that we can hope for 2016. But, you know, listening to all of the speakers here, I'm more and more convinced, you know, that prohibitions just first has proven to be ineffective. Second is, of course, hypocritical if you think that we prohibit cannabis, yes, but we regulate and tolerate alcohol that kills 2.5 million people per year, or tobacco that kills 50% of its users at one point in, in life. And then, of course, it's unmanageable because the list of new drugs that come to the Commission uh, in WHO that then have to go to the CND to be scheduled, I mean, there are hundreds of new drugs per year. So th that list, th the way of managing things is, is unmanageable. And fourth and last, of course, it's irrealistic. 
because people will use drugs. So we better design new conventions that will focus on reducing the harms rather than on the illusion of a drug-free world and of the effectiveness of prohibition. Thank you very much. To reimpress that in simple words, 2016 will not bring the end of the war on drugs, but very likely it will bring the beginning of the end of war on drugs. <laughs> the last question, and then we have to really thanks to interpreters and to go for a lunch. So the last question, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, yes. Mr. Chairman. Sorry. And, uh, my name is Reznik, and I'm here as a speaker. Also, I'm a representative of International Association of Cannabinoid Medicine. So I would like to ask the panel why uh, you suppose that it could be